Our world has shrunk into the 30 centimeters between our eyes and our smartphone. We are all zoomed in. Let's stop that and zoom out instead. Learn about the universe and your life will change forever, for the better. My crash course in astronomy will give you a fresh look at your own existence, a new perspective on life and a gentler way to view the world and the people on it. So put your smartphones away for a minute. Give yourself some space in the most literal sense. Don't look down at your screen, look up at the stars. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Ladies and gentlemen, you are in for a treat. Coming to us today uh, is an author that I have uh, loved his work from the time I first encountered him in Scientific American uh, to his previous book, uh, Ripples in Space Time, the Einstein Gravitational Waves in the Future of Astronomy, which featured uh, my favorite CMB experiment, uh, at least until this book came out. That was uh, Bicep 2 is featured heavily in this book. Uh, some friends of the show like Barry Barish, Ray Weiss, Kip Thorne are in that book. But this book features the Simons Observatory, and so we got to talk about that. But it's uh, Govert Schilling, who is a Dutch writer originally, but he is uh, one of my favorite authors. I love this book. I love all your writing. Sky and Telescope, everywhere I find you, Govert Schilling. How are you doing today, sir? I'm very uh, doing very well, uh, Brian. Thanks for having me on your uh, podcast. And I'm especially doing very well because I'm not in my home country, the Netherlands, but I'm in Sweden, in the north of Europe, because my daughter, who lives here, uh, was uh, married just two days ago. So uh, I'm happy. Congratulations. Thank you. What could be <laughs> what could be better? Every father of young girls and older girls dreams of the day when that will happen, and then right. uh, she's somebody else's prop. No, I'm just kidding. We love our <laughs> girls. The girls are the best. I have uh, in both of my girls' rooms, I have posters of Maria Gephardt Mayer and uh, all these scientists. I don't know what your daughter is interested in, but um, but coming from the Netherlands, I wonder if you've always had kind of a natural inclination towards the telescope and the microscope, because you can tell us uh, what yeah, is the connection um, between the telescope and the microscope. To, uh, uh, to of course, since uh, uh, both instruments were first developed in the Netherlands, but I didn't learn about that uh, after I, uh, b before I started to become interested in astronomy as a young teenager uh, boy, that was in the Apollo days in the 1960s, uh, I got hooked on astronomy. I, uh, I had a, a Saturday job in a supermarket, so I saved some money to buy a telescope, became a member of a youth association here in the Netherlands. And what I did was make drawings of the moon and of the planets and all those kind of things. And I love to read because I've always loved to read books and I've also always loved to write about the topics that I, lo I love. So when I was a member of this youth association in the Netherlands, I also started to write for them. And uh, that's how it all started. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I never took up an academic study in astronomy, which I never have done uh, because it just was my hobby. Mm. And um, so in a sense, I've turned my hobby into a profession and that's good. Yes, uh, your avocation has become your vocation. Uh, and of course, uh, I believe that <clears throat> both the microscope and the telescope were invented by guys by the name of Hans. Uh, uh, at least I know that for the telescope. And uh, that's because my, my good friend Galileo Galilei, uh, who we just translated with Frank Wilczek and Carlo Rovelli and uh, Fabio Legionati, we just made the first ever, not translation, but but we did the first ever audio book of Galileo. You can find that on my website. Uh, but he talks about in Sidereus Nuncius, you know, how old man, you know, he just recently discovered a device that came by way of the low country, the Netherlands. Uh -huh. um, and, uh, and I wonder, you know, uh, I often think about, you know, what other instrument from the telescope to the Large Hadron Collider to the microscope to uh, CRISPR technology, is there any other technology that has changed the universe, our perception of our place within it more than the telescope? Hmm. Yeah, I think 
basically, I think the telescope and the microscope are the two main instruments because they just give us a view beyond our natural scope of, of yeah. observation. We have some sort of biological and natural way of looking at the world. So uh, to be able to see the very small and to be able to see the very uh, big and very distant, that's really important. And obviously, the other thing that has been very important in learning our world is the, uh, uh, the possibility to go to other places. Yeah. And funny enough, the Netherlands played an important role in that too, because the first seafarers and the uh, ma major explorers, many of them were from the low countries. And uh, obviously, uh, today we're talking about space flight and flying our spacecraft to other planets and other satellites. But in the past, it was visiting uh, other continents and other countries and seeing things that you did not have at home. I think these three things, going to other places, going to look at other scales, uh, very small, and going to look at very remote distances, like in cosmology and astronomy. Those may have been the, uh, the biggest changes in our uh, learning and, and, and knowing about the world. And there's no shortage of uh, Dutchmen in this book, uh, which is called The Elephant in the Universe. We'll get to that uh, uh, as we go on. But the uh, the thing I love to do with all the authors who honor us with their presence on the Into the Impossible podcast, my regular listeners will know this by heart. It's a game that we call judging books by their covers. So this book um, came with a, uh, a beautiful picture and a very kind of um, maybe mysterious title, unlike this book, uh, which was uh, written a couple years back and has uh -huh. many, many uh, interesting experiments and, and things that we're familiar with, as I said, past guests. It even has a foreword by past guest Martin Rees on this book. Uh, Lord Martin was on the podcast not too long ago last year. Year. And uh, but this one has our good friend Avi Loeb, who mm -hmm. is no stranger for searching for things that no one's ever seen before. So Govert, I want to ask you a question: yeah. What is the meaning of the title of this book? What is the meaning of the picture on the cover? And uh, and why did you choose Avi Loeb of all people to uh, to grace it with a beautiful forward? Yeah, let's start with the last question. Uh, uh, the book was published by Harvard University Press, and uh, Avi is obviously uh, uh, connected to uh, Harvard University. And uh, I know him a little bit. I interviewed him uh, uh, for part of the book. And uh, I, I have to say that I made a suggestion to the publishers. Uh, maybe we could ask him to write a foreword. I, uh, I didn't like to ask Martin Rees again. Probably, he probably would have declined for a second time. And uh, we all knew that... Um, that Avi has been dealing with looking for extraterrestrials and the whole thing about uh, Oumuamua, the visitor from outer space. And not everyone is taking his claims about uh, or his possibilities about uh, ET too serious. But I said, well, uh, in any case, he's a famous name and it uh, might might uh, might push the sales of the book because everybody knows who he yeah. is. And uh, this book is not about aliens, not at all. It's about a serious uh, uh, scientific mystery in which he is uh, uh, dabbling a lot too. So he is working on uh, a variety of theories on dark matter. So we decided this was uh, safe to do and he was happy to, uh, to, uh, to do that. And then working backwards with your three questions, um, my publisher came up, the designer at Harvard came up with the idea of not using a traditional dark blue or black cover for this book, uh, because almost every astronomy book has a black cover or a purple <laughs> cover right. or a dark blue cover. And uh, he thought maybe when we combine this with, with the starry background in the elephant shape and then use all the uh, covers of the rainbow, because it's it's, it attracts the attention, so it's it's a very, yeah, I I, I like it very much. So this is uh, this is the other thing. But then getting to your first question about the title, that's really an interesting story, because it's a it's a broad topic. Uh, uh, dark matter is about history and it's about physics, particle physics, cosmology, theory, all kind of things, and yeah, you could. Uh, call this book um, Searching for Dark Matter or whatever you want to choose. But it was, in fact, my European agent who came up with a suggestion for this title. And he said, I've been thinking about it. And what about the title? The Elephant in the Universe. And I was immediately enthusiastic for a couple of reasons. First of all, 
Dark matter, as most of your uh, uh, viewers will know, is is about a lot of mass in the universe. It's about 85% of all the matter in the universe is unknown to us, is dark, is mysterious. So it's a lot of mass. So the elephant is a good metaphor for that because it's a very massive animal. But then obviously you also have these uh, connotations with, with certain sayings like the elephant in the room. We all know what we're talking about uh, when there's a big problem that's that is mysterious, but we sort of walk around it. We don't want to put our finger on it. And that's something that has been happening in dark matter uh, research for a long time. Because as my book shows in the first chapters, it all started out in the 1930s, 1920s actually, about a, a century ago. And then in the 1940s and the 1950s and most of the 60s, not that much happened about this riddle of dark matter. People knew about it and it just walked around it like it was the elephant in the room. Hmm. And uh, finally, there's also um, uh, a Dutch uh, saying. I don't know if that's a known saying in, in, uh, in English too, but we say uh, the elephant in the... Uh, in the porcelain, uh, in the china cupboard. That's what we're ah, saying. Right. Elephant in the china cupboard. He's <laughs> rambling around and destroying everything. <laughs> and um, that's a nice connotation too, because this problem of dark matter may may well uh, stir up all our current thinking about the universe. It may lead us to to a whole new understanding of physics and cosmology. So I love the title a lot. It works very well in the in Dutch too. The book has been translated into the into Dutch already, and it will also be at least a Chinese and a German uh, edition. So I think it's a uh, it's a very good suggestion from my agent. And in combination with the cover and the foreword, I like it a lot. And I hope that people who judge the book by the cover will uh, be attracted to it, like dark matter is attracting a lot of Absolutely. other matter in our universe. And no spoilers, but you talk about in the very beginning of the book, so it's not really a spoiler, that we don't have the answer. Uh, what I loved about the title, uh, actually the, the subtitle, you say our, um, which is, you know, inclusive, which is nice, but, uh, but also uh, it really kind of connotes the fact that we are in this together. This mystery that we're trying to solve is a global mystery. It's a mystery conversation through the ages, through time. You start with the first person uh, who is Dutch, uh, Capitan, I think is how you pronounce his name, uh, who really coined the term in English uh, mm -hmm. and, and really did a lot of this work. Ort obviously plays a role in the book as well. Um, and, uh, and so there is a Dutch <clears throat> um, thread that runs throughout it, uh, not not too overly uh, heavy-handed, but but very nice. And uh, I only know one Dutch saying, and it's what my late great colleague Hans Parr uh, used to call me uh, when I acted stupid. He said, "You are cluff in a molen." Does that make sense? Cluff in a molen. Have you ever heard that? Hit with a windmill. Yeah, I know the windmill, so obviously. I don't, I don't know exactly what you were meaning by that saying. Cough, no. or maybe cough in the morning. Ah, okay. You, uh, yeah, you, you got a, a hit by the uh, by one of the wings of the windmill. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that would be pretty obvious. You'd be you'd be hard pressed not to notice if you got hit by a windmill. But, um, but dark matter is very subtle, and, and we don't know much about it. As you say, we don't know the answer by the end of this book. But I wonder if we could start off with um, maybe a different tact. I've talked in my show, I've done videos, which I'll link to above, uh, about the only type of dark matter that we know for sure exists is the neutral. Um, mm -hmm. But throughout the history of physics, people have done one of two things to explain strange gravitational effects. They've postulated new forms of matter. Yeah as is in the case of Neptune, the, the prediction right. and discovery of Neptune. And then they predicted new forces and dynamical uh, features of fields, as in the case of Einstein, explaining mm -hmm. the anomalous behavior of the perihelion of Mercury. Uh, today, there's a lot in this book and in physics about new particles, new forces, new fields, um, but not as much attention to uh, to the kind of outliers, the, the, the maybe somewhat out of left field, as we say in America, uh, suggestions of modifications to not Einstein, mm -hmm. but to Newton. Can we start yeah. with, uh, with an interview that you did with um, Mati Mordecai Milgram uh, in Israel at Weizmann and, uh, and his theory? And where does that stand now? First of all, what is that theory? Is it appealing? 
Um, is there any point in taking it seriously at this point? Uh, first, describe the so-called modified Newtonian dynamics yeah. or mod. Right. Yeah. Well, it's a very exciting and interesting idea but, uh, because uh, Milgram, back in the early 1980s, I believe, uh, he uh, learned about this problem of dark matter and he uh, thought it was sort of made up, like uh, we see particular movements in galaxies and motions of stars and we come up just with a solution by proposing there's a, a lot of unseen mysterious matter in the universe. And he thought, well, maybe I can also explain it by tuning the, the laws of gravity a little bit. And that was also um, sort of made up to to fit the answer so he came up with a modification of newtonian gravity um that's something i come back to uh, in a moment and he suggested a different kind of uh, newtonian gravitational law and this gravitational law that he came up with could explain the the weird rotational uh, properties of of spiral galaxies so he said well maybe we're just misunderstanding gravity and we need to change that and not many people took that too serious back then but uh, even now uh, it has never been uh, 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 written off, so to say. So uh, th there is no observation, there's no uh, clear indication that Mont, as the theory is, is known, that it's, it must be wrong. It's still a possibility that there is some truth to it. And that's very interesting because many other alternative theories have been, uh, have been ruled out over the decades. And Milgram's theory still is a, a sort of a viable theory. And he has a not a very big, but a very loyal uh, group of scientists following in his steps, even a number of many of young people, young scientists who, who are maybe more eager or more creative to embrace these new kind of ideas. And um, there's still some possibility that this might be uh, uh, the, the solution to the problem. There's a couple of things. You, you ask what is the, the current status of MONT? One problem is it's a modification of Newtonian dynamics, and it has turned out to be very, very difficult to get a similar modification to Einsteinian uh, gravity, uh, gravity. And obviously, we need to do that because we know Einstein is a more uh, a, a better theory than Newton. So if you want to change your theory of gravity, in the end, you need to have a modification of Einstein. And people are working on that. And uh, even a couple of months ago, there was a new publication in, uh, in that direction, but it's all very, very complicated. And that means that the theory of Mont has problems with explaining everything that has to do with Einstein, like explaining gravitational lensing, which is the bending of light as described by Einstein's theory. And also with, uh, by explaining even the, uh, the expansion of the universe. So there's a couple of loose ends in Mont but I have to say, I, I wrote at least one one chapter on this uh, alternative theory for dark matter, and I, I talked to Milgram and uh, some of his followers a lot. And I'm, I've also always been intrigued by this idea, uh, because when you read about all these kind of things, and scientists thinking that they, that they know there must be this many dark matter, and we just don't know what it is, but we'll probably find out, as a reader, and certain as a non-academic or a hobby astronomer that, that I was, you always get this feeling, can that really be true? And then if there's one one single person who comes up with an alternative theory, you feel some sympathy for him. So even back in the 1980s, uh, I first read about Milgram's theory and I, I thought, yeah, that's, that sounds much, much more interesting. And, <laughs> and the funny thing is, it's still not ruled out. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, another Dutch physicist in Amsterdam, uh, Erik Verlinde, he's working on a new alternative theory of gravity, still in a very early stage. But it has a couple of, uh, a couple of comparisons with Milgram's theory and also is a, an alternative theory of explaining dark matter. So who knows what will happen in the next uh, couple of years? Right. Well, uh, of course, Milgram is is Israeli and the late great uh, Jacob Beckenstein was Israeli and mm -hmm. he came up with a relativistic version called Tevez or Taylor yeah. vector, uh, tensor vector scalar. Um, and so I'm going to not use a Dutch phrase now, but a, but a Hebrew phrase translated into English, which is, you know, prove to me 
uh, the the existence of dark matter while the uh, standing on one leg, uh, so to speak. So, uh-huh. what is the most convincing uh, aspect of dark matter to you that um, p- motivates that we need it in the in the yeah. universe? I mean, we can't see it, we can't smell it, we can't touch it, we haven't detected it. Um, what makes you and other science or other physicists rather uh, believe in the truth of its existence? It's a very uh, interesting question because there's a a strange uh, change or evolution in the history of science here. When dark matter came up as a problem for the first time in the uh, past century, it was all about uh, gravity and motions and dynamics, uh, the rotation curves of galaxies, like the outer parts of galaxies appear to move too fast, the motions of Uh, galaxies and clusters. Uh, It was all about uh, uh, the influence of gravity, the gravitational uh, uh, influence of of this proposed dark matter. And that's how I learned about it for the first time, because I was interested in astronomy and I read about all these uh, kind of things. But the interesting thing is, right now, I believe that the most compelling reason to believe, so to say, in dark matter is not the rotation curves of galaxies anymore. And it's not the motion of galaxies and clusters. It's the cosmic background radiation. And you know all about that. Hmm. And we have we have studied and mapped the CMB in such a high detail and with all the statistical properties of these tiny temperature fluctuations in the CMB, people try to explain these statistical properties. And the only single, only way they, they can do that is to introduce both dark matter and dark energy. And as soon as you change the amount of mysterious dark matter, because we still don't know what it is, as soon as you change that by just a percent or change the properties of this mysterious dark energy a little bit, your your calculations do not match the observations of the cosmic uh, microwave background anymore. So the funny thing is, if we did not have all these dynamical uh, 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 observations like rotation curves and motions of galaxies, if that had never been observed, even the CMB observations of today would tell us there must be a lot of dark matter in the universe. Otherwise, we can never go from the universe back then, as we observe its properties in the cosmic back- background radiation, to the universe right now with the observed distribution of clusters and galaxies. The only way scientists are able to do that is uh, using the uh, the gravity of dark matter. And I believe this is by now, and it's more of a physical reason than a, a classical astronomical reason to believe in it, but that's the most compelling reason to believe in the stuff. Mm. Yeah, I, I often point that out. Yeah, we, we hear a lot about rotation curves and, and uh, of course, you know, Zwicky is so prominent in the discussion of it. And whenever I do a, a, a discussion about dark matter and I bring up um, uh, uh, Vera Rubin, who spent not a small amount of time here at UC San Diego working with her colleague, Margaret Burbage, and, uh, and her husband, Jeff Burbage. Mm-hmm. But Margaret was really the observer that taught Vera Rubin while she was on sabbatical here in the 1960s uh, how to use a uh, a spectrograph to take observations of galaxies and her her work with Ford who you interviewed in this book Vera's work uh, really was was definitive in many of our minds uh, making the reality the case for its reality uh, even more so than than dark energy at least for a long time and yet you know the fact that we've known about dark matter for so much longer since the you know since captain maybe but but also uh-huh. you know since wiki uh, and had evidence for its existence um i wonder you know is there a point at which you would counsel my colleagues uh some of whom are here uh like uh like kaishuan ni nee, who helps co-run the xenon experiment with your friend and my friend elena april and past guest but um when would you tell an, uh, a physicist you got to stop this experiment i mean you don't keep running you know once you detect the uh, the bottom quark, they don't just keep running it and 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 getting more and more decimal places. It, is there or would there ever come a point where you go over it? Would tell my colleagues, your your friends that you interview in this book, stop the search. It's not it's not going to pan out. 
Yeah, it's uh, that's a very hard question because it. I, I will make a comparison to uh, another interesting thing, and and uh, that's the search for. Uh, alien technology, extraterrestrial life, the SETI search, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. We've never found it. And uh, then you can say, well, let's stop it because it's, it's, uh, we probably will, will never find it. But the other thing is that the people who do the search will tell you, oh, man, but we've just started. We are only just beginning. We, uh, there's so many uh, uh, areas to explore. And I think for the physical, uh, the particle physics search for dark matter is more or less the same. So it would be hard for me to tell professional scientists, oh, you'd better stop because you will probably never find. But the thing is, they will have to stop. Uh, searching for it by the way they do it right now, like the xenon experiments with these big underground laboratories where they try to find the, the very rare interactions of dark matter par particles with, 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 with atom, atomic nuclei, they will have to stop because if these instruments get about, and they have been incre increasing in sensitivity over the years, many, many times, but if they increase the sensitivity more than 10 times over the current value, they, and, and the signal from dark matter would be below that. They will never find it because neutrinos, which you mentioned before, will take over. And at that very low level of signal, neutrinos are everywhere and they will sort of disturb your experiment. And if dark matter is so elusive that you will not find it by the next generation of xenon experiments, then this way of looking for it will have to stop because it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. So. Um, the, the, the xenon scientists, the particle physicists who are looking for it uh, by this kind of experiments, they really hope that this next generation will give their answer because otherwise they're out of uh, out of the game and they have to find other ways to to look for this mysterious stuff. So maybe it's it's nature itself who tells us when and where to stop. <laughs> Very good. So reminder, we're talking uh, with Govert Schilling, who's a favorite of author of mine. He's the author of dozens of books, articles. You find him in, sign, in, um, in uh, the Sky and Telescope and many other things. He won the David Schramm Award from the American Astronomical Society. And in 2007, he got his own piece of dark matter named after him, <laughs> uh, an asteroid called a 10986 Govert in his honor. Uh, it's such a it's such a delight to talk to you. So uh, I am reminded of uh, of a book by uh, or maybe it's a saying. I think it's a book by Sherlock Holmes, a great mystery writer, um, and it was called The Dog That Didn't Bark. And uh -huh. it's all about you know how you can notice something by its absence, not necessarily looking for its presence. So what's so unusual about a dog that doesn't bark? Well, I mean, I think a lot of it is is you know kind of in the in the sense that. Of all the things we know really well, and of course you know that people criticize astronomers, at least from the you know maybe unorthodox side, but say, oh well, you don't know what ninety-five percent of the universe is made up of. Uh -huh. so why should I listen to you about the Earth being <laughs> around and all this other nonsense that we talk? So um, I find some of the strongest evidence for dark matter comes from our our exquisite knowledge about ordinary matter, baryonic matter, the matter that makes up uh, you and you and me and and the and this in your asteroid and everything else the protons the neutrons yeah. uh, i always say the croutons my favorite edible uh edible particle the pion which is made of pies i think uh, but <laughs> but you know we know so much about ordinary matter and i want to talk about the tools and what what is sort of of all the you're you're kind of this um uh traveler in this book this hero making a journey to conferences during covid and different countries different continents uh and um of all the different tools and technologies, which one is sort of um, the most interesting? Maybe one coming in the future. You talk about axion searches. Um, what is uh, uh, about the technology? Is it the computer? Is it the supercomputer inside of our skull? What technology is the most, you know, exciting, uh, if not, you know, most promising, but most interesting to you personally? Yeah. Well, first of all, we certainly do not have a supercomputer in our skull. I think our brain is is pretty limited, and that's and it's very good that you mentioned the computer revolution because without the computer revolution, most of uh, today's science could not have been uh, done at all. Right. I mean, the the big particle accelerators and even the xenon uh, experiments they produce such a huge amount of computing instruments to to even 
uh, search through the data to find what you're looking for. Um, but in terms of experiments, it's uh, it's a good question because again, my background is in astronomy. So I know telescopes and I've been to many observatories all over the world and I've been impressed by big, well, I've, I've been at, at your uh, experiment at the South Pole, which yeah. was a, a very, very interesting uh, trip, obviously. So that people are able and and uh, to to build and construct and think up these kind of experiments in such remote places or like the alma observatory at, at five kilometers altitude above sea level in chile these are all extremely impressive but in preparing this book i paid a visit to the big CERN laboratory in switzerland the big particle physics laboratory and i i had always been impressed by big astronomical instruments they might be as big as as a car uh, behind a telescope but here at CERN we have an experiment a detector which is as big as as a castle it's it's a huge thing it's 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 about the mass of the of the Notre Dame in Paris and it's uh, all filled up with wires and detectors and electronics and to see that in action is incredibly impressive and I think that when you when you think about understanding the matter that we are all made of, we have made such giant leaps over the past decades using these kind of experiments. That's really tremendously impressive to me because uh, I think finding out more about normal matter may well be the way of uh, solving the riddle of dark matter because after all, it's all part of part of one universe, part of one nature. Nature doesn't care what we call it. Nature just has a bunch of particles and the fact that we have not discovered all of them and call some of them dark matter, nature doesn't care. It's just a complete, uh, complete uh, well, system of, of particles and forces. So maybe the solution to this problem may come from the more or less regular experiments in particle physics. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, as you uh, you and your listeners probably know, over the past uh, year, there has been a couple of uh, observations that there might be hints of a possible fifth force in the in, in nature, because yeah. muons, the, the, the nephews of, of normal electrons, are behaving a little bit strange. And um, if this really pans out and it turns out to be uh, uh, to be uh, uh, seen by other experiments too, this may well lead us to a new understanding of the uh, of, of the uh, of our current understanding of the uh, of particle physics, and it may well lead to a better understanding of dark matter too. Yeah. Um, what is it like to write a book where the story is not as you know cleanly wrapped up as it was in this book? You know, you Nobel Prize award, you know, which I yeah. often talked about in, in negative terms is kind of like uh, false history of the of not your book, but but yeah. the, it gives a distorted impression about you know what what are the stakes involved? And, and in this book, there is no conclusion. I'm asking for myself because you know we're we're involved in documentaries and things about the CMB, and you can find those mm -hmm. online. Um, and and it's always about the promise of the future. And yeah. this current book, The Elephant in the Universe, has an awful lot of promise for the future. But as you said, there is an ultimate stop sign, the yeah. new cosmic neutrino background or the supernova um, relic neutrino background. How is it to write a book where there is no you know tidy ending and chat and you know the third act of the of the of the play? How, how did how did you handle that ambiguity? Yeah. Of yeah. There's a fun story here. I think I mentioned it in my uh, in my introduction, uh, because uh, in the late in the in the mid 1990s, I was doing research for a book on extrasolar planets because I knew there are new experiments and maybe within a couple of years they will find the first planet and then. Uh, uh, well, let's start researching the book. And even before I started writing, the first extrasolar planet was discovered, so I had to hurry up producing that book, which has never been published in the United States, by the way, but you have many exoplanet books there uh, by your own. And then a couple of years later, with the a, with a gravitational wave book, the Ripples in Space Time book that you just showed, it's it was more or less the same, because there would be a second generation of uh, the gravitational wave detectors coming online soon, and I thought, well, when they start to do their measurements, maybe within three or four years, we will have the detection of gravitational waves. So I started to work on this book and bang, right after they switched the detector on, they found the first gravitational wave. And again, I had to hurry. But in both cases of these two books, 
the, the real discovery was in the book, obviously. And that was good. So when I started to think about the dark matter book and I talked to all these scientists, I jokingly said to them, well, you got to prepare yourself because when I start writing a book, the scientists usually make the final discovery. And that didn't happen. And um, it's it's hard, Brian. I, uh, I know it's difficult because you want to go to a climax. You want to make the story complete. And it didn't happen in this case. And I was prepared for that. So what I try to do, and it's, I, I hope I succeeded. What I try to do is give people a feeling of how it is to work on a search where you do not know what the final goal uh, or the final uh, route will be. Uh, you you will you do not know whether or not you will be successful, but you need this passion and this uh, uh, yeah this this uh, this 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 way of of going on with with this kind of experiments to to be able to do it. And what I what I hope that I have done is throughout the book, people who were looking for dark matter, they came up with new experiments, they came up with new observational technology, they came up with new theories. And all these experiments and technologies and theories have given us a much broader vision of our universe. And it's about uh, the distribution of matter in the universe, and it's about the CMB, and it's about distant galaxies, and it's about the makeup of galaxies and the formation of structure in the universe. And all those kind of topics have been dealt with by people who were interested in solving the dark matter mystery. Mm. So even if we will never find dark matter, it has been a way of discovering our universe. And in a sense, I will make that comparison again. In a sense, it's like searching for extraterrestrial life. We have not found it yet, and maybe we will not find it in our lifetime, and maybe we will never find it. But looking for extraterrestrial life has given us astrobiology, it has given us extrasolar planets, it has given us chemical evolution of the uh, universe, it has given us the uh, knowledge of about the origin of our solar system. So maybe we need such big mysteries as a drive to push forward our our understanding of the universe, and hopefully that will happen with uh, with this topic too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, going back to my uh, predilection for discussing aberrations or perhaps uh, iconoclasts or uh, unorthodox topics in this uh, book uh, is the story of the Dama experiment, which is has fascinated me for 25 years, and I imagine many other people as well. Uh, I don't have many criticisms of this book uh, that you've written, uh, but uh, but if there's one, I would have loved to have seen even more kind of psychological uh, uh, discussion of what's going on in these people's minds. We have this experiment that claims something like what? Go over 13 sigma uh, evidence for dark matter, not only for dark matter, but for an annual modulation of the signal. Yeah. Talk about what it was like to talk to these people. I, I get, I'm, and I'm only teasing. I don't criticize the book at all. But uh, someone like Harry Collins, uh, you know, who gets into the sociology of of, uh, of scientists, maybe mm -hmm. he, I can convince him to to do a book about this collaboration someday. But maybe he wouldn't yeah. get anywhere because they're so secretive, right? So talk about what is the Dama experiment? What is the annual modulation? modulation, which was predicted by a past guest on the show and good friends of mine and collaborators yeah. on the Simons Observatory, Katie Fries and, and David Spurgle. Um, talk about mm -hmm. DAMA. What is annual modulation? Why should we care? And what is going on? Maybe speculate on why they are so yeah. perhaps um, uh, unwilling yeah. to share their data and results. Okay, so DAMA stands for dark matter. It's just an abbreviation. And it's an uh, experiment run by Italian physicists. And it's based in Italy, in the Gran Sasso Laboratory, which is deep uh, in the Apennine Mountains, uh, uh, away from all the cosmic disturbances that you may get. And it's the same location where also the, the big uh, international xenon experiment is based. So uh, there are a lot of dark matter experiments going on there. Now, what they claim to have found is this. When when our Milky Way galaxy is is uh, is situated in inside a big halo of dark matter, these particles must be all around us, and our solar system is moving through this cloud of uh, of dark matter particles. So you should see a certain sort of flux of dark matter particles. That's what Xenon also tries to find: the dark matter particles that that are supposedly 
all around us. Now, what Dama says, our Earth is also circling around the Sun. So sometimes when the Sun is moving in this direction through the galaxy and our Earth is circling around the Sun, sometimes they're moving in the same direction and some in the opposite direction. So the flux of dark matter particles should show, show a tiny variation over the year. And that's something that people had predicted uh, a couple of decades ago. And um, people have been looking for it and never found it. And now here comes this tiny DAMA experiment, and they claim they have found this signal. So you would suppose when they first uh, presented their results that everybody would say, yeah, we have found it finally, and the, okay. the problem has been uh, solved. But that's not how science works. Scientists will always, when they hear a, 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 a proposed solution, they will also always be critical, and they will uh, they will ask the scientists, uh, maybe you, do, you did this wrong, or maybe your analysis is wrong, or uh, let us do a, a second experiment to see if we can co confirm it. And the DAMA experimentalists have always been a little bit secretive about their, uh, about their experiments in the sense that they produced their final conclusions. They published their final conclusions, and their conclusions seem to be very... Uh, uh, very convincing, as you said, uh, many sigma uh, results, but they have never uh, they have never been willing to produce their raw data so that other people could do uh, uh, their own analysis on the data to see if they come up with the same results. Um, the other thing that I found, which was a little bit of a surprise to me, I thought I'm this science journalist. I'm not a competing scientist. I'm not involved with any other experiment. I'm just a a uh, neutral science journalist doing a book on this project. Dear Italian Dama physicist, you claim to have found dark matter. I'll give you a call. Let's uh, make an appointment for an interview and uh, I will visit your experiment and we talk about it. You can explain all to me and it will be a big chapter in my book. And the response was, when I uh, emailed the, uh, the leader of this project, the response was, no, we never do oral interviews with journalists. The only way we be in touch with you will be answering your questions through email. Mm -hmm. And well, as you can tell from the, tell from the discussion we have right now, uh, the way we are discussing uh, my book right now would never be possible by exchanging questions and answers through email. Yeah. So when I send them a list of questions, pretty critical questions, pretty uh, informative questions. Uh, they came up with very basic answers, like one or two sentences. And it didn't make, yeah, it didn't help me at all to hmm. to, to learn more about it. So I think that the biggest criticism of the Dharma scientists is not their publications, but it's the, the fact that nobody can check how they came up with these published results because they they keep the data to themselves um, they have not uh, been willing to tell too much about the setup of their experiments and by now we have a big problem because you would say well if dama finds this that there must be something to it but obviously there can be many kind of other influences that may create a, a spurious annual variation in the signal and if dama is correct and if their annual modulation is due to dark matter that would tell you the amount of dark matter would be at a certain level and if it really is at that level the current version of the xenon experiment would easily detect it and it detects none right and then the other thing is a couple of uh, scientists have reproduced the dama experiment as best as they can and uh, uh, one of these experiments is based in the uh, in the uh, Pyrenees between Spain and uh, and France, uh, also in the mountains, and they published their first results uh, about half a year or a year ago, and they don't see any annual variation at all. Mm -hmm. So, not many people are convinced about it, and it's it's a shame because this is a valid experiment and. Uh, everybody would love to work together with these Italian scientists to to solve the riddle, and maybe it will keep going like this for a long time. Yeah, and I think you know one of the hallmarks of a good scientist. I'm not casting aspersions on them, but just speaking generally, is that you want 
criticism. You want attention, uh, even if it's negative, because mm -hmm. that makes your discovery anti yeah, true. It makes it robust. Yeah. It makes it immune to uh, to future attacks and solidifies it in the scientific canon. Now, one way they could do that is to do what good scientists have always known, is that there's more than one way to get any signal, including uh, going back to uh, the Galileo and his prediction about the tides and how he thought uh -huh. about it and was completely wrong, as I point out. And he could have done a simple measurement, as he did, to prove uh, Aristotle wrong that heavier objects fall faster than lighter ones. So it's doing experiments and it's accounting for what are called systematics. So there's yeah. fundamental irreducible noise you can only reduce by taking more data, and that's called statistical noise, statistical errors. And then there's so called systematic errors, which are either associated with your instrument, the system, or the environment in which it's. In or the planet which it's on <laughs> and or you know where it is in the galaxy is in the yeah. case of bicep 2 and and the signal that we later uh, uh, retracted our, our claim mm -hmm. that it was due to inflation and more the from the presence of dust in the Milky Way galaxy yeah. which by the way you can get if you're in America I am on my mailing list uh, join it and you live in the US I will send you some space dust which is the villain of my book uh, and that's at briankeating.com slash list Check that out. Check out Gover Schilling's website. We'll have links to all that in the show notes down below. But um, but in the case of Dama, they could easily show that it's not systematic errors by repeating this uh, sodium iodide experiment in the southern hemisphere, right? I mean, that would give right. an anti-variant, but they've not yet done that. Other teams, I understand, are. Um, what do you mm -hmm. make of, and, and you mentioned the uh, liquid xenon detectors that are also uh, obviously hot on the, and have really obliterated uh, much of the competition, including my uh, favorite, you know, previous experiments, which were like the CDS MS experiments, the the uh -huh. the uh, germanium uh, and silicon detectors. So now those have just been wiped off the map by uh, people like my friend Richard Gateskill and Alina April. Talk about what you call the xenon wars. This is a very actually I didn't know this about uh, you know you always assume your friends are friends with each other, but uh, that could not be farther from the truth in certain cases. Uh, Elena is is one of my favorite scientists. She we did a um, we did an uh, event here right before the pandemic with her right around her birthday in March of 2020, and that was called Chasing Einstein, uh, and that was with mm -hmm. a filmmaker uh, uh, from LA that that uh, has done such wonderful work on that documentary. Um, talk about uh, Elena, her personality, uh, the, the kind of Italian, and there are a lot of Italians that work in dark matter detection, mm -hmm. a lot of Italian women, uh, which is really cool. But talk about um, talk about her personality, maybe what she, what you observe from her lessons that she learned from her experience with Rubia, Nobel laureate, and, and other uh, approaches, but also her kind of obsession in some ways, and I teased her about that, you know, that she fixates on this Nobel Prize and she really wants to detect it, uh, and and does so as, a, as a, you know, with the with the greatest experimental, you know, equipment, team, ideas, and skills that she has. Talk about her personality. Talk about this xenon, what you call the xenon wars. Yeah, I think uh, Elena April is uh, one of the most intriguing persons uh, who I met in uh, researching this book. Uh, uh, I have to say that uh, before I started uh, researching this book, I had. Uh, uh, I had read about the xenon experiment, but I didn't know the, the people involved very much, as, as it was more particle physics than astronomy. So uh, when I understood that she was leading this experiment ever since the start of the century, I thought, well, I need to visit her and uh, look her up in uh, New York, where, where she lives. And uh, I did that, and it was a, a very exciting um, uh, and interesting uh, day that we that we met in her uh, Brooklyn apartment, and she talked about all the history. And what I learned from her was uh, how important it is to be really passionate about what you want to uh, to reach. Ever since she was a young girl, she had set her mind on becoming a famous physicist, and every time the goal was. Uh, higher and higher, and when she worked on uh, on certain detectors for uh, detecting gamma rays from from space, uh, she realized that maybe that is not something in which there is uh, a big discovery space left anymore. I, I'm not sure if that's true, but but around that time when she was doing this kind of experiment, she learned about dark matter for the first time. 
Uh, even particle physicists sometimes do not know about what, what their colleagues are working on. And when she heard about this problem, she got hooked on solving the problem of dark matter, especially since her work with noble gases would uh, make it possible to uh, to work on this kind of xenon detectors that she helped uh, develop. Yeah. So she changed careers and she... Um, uh, she applied for uh, National Science Foundation money and she received it and she built up her own research group and started with a with a very tiny uh, test experiment in her lab, a tabletop experiment more or less. And she has been working and working all the time and as soon as one experiment is being uh, uh, becomes operational, uh, work is already uh, going on on the next version of the experiment. So she just will never give up. And uh, what, what excites me about this is, is what will happen, I, I, I hope not for her, but what will happen if the, the xenon development, as I said before, when it becomes 10 or, or, or a couple of tens of times more sensitive, uh, it won't work anymore because neutrinos will take over the uh, uh, the, the signal level. What will you do when you have spent decades of your professional career in in improving this technique and searching and looking for it, hoping that you will make the final discovery and it will not happen? That, that must be a big psychological shock. So we talked about all this and part of it, uh, what, what was the reason why I uh, why I uh, mentioned, wh wh why I gave this chapter the title The Xenon Wars, is that there's not just one group. Uh, she used to work with, uh, with uh, Rick uh, Gateskell, uh, whom you just uh, mentioned, and with a couple of other uh, American scientists. So it's really an international experiment. A lot of Dutch people too. Mm -hmm. Her own husband was involved in this project too. But then uh, Gateskell and a couple of his colleagues, they thought, well, Italy is far away and we have some other things of uh, thinking how we can do it and maybe we can set up our own experiment, also using xenon, same kind of technology. So they split and it, it was not a real war, but it was not a, a, a nice story too, because when you have a big research group and some people in your group say, well, we don't want to cooperate anymore and we set up our own group, that's uh, well, it's complicated. Let's call it that way. And then there was a third group in, in China yeah. where her husband went, went to after they, they got divor divorced already. So it's really it's a really a mix of personal relations and colleagues that were friends of you and even your, your uh, ex-husband uh, whom you had worked with. And then suddenly you are all more or less competing because you're working with the same kind of technology, the same kind of, uh, of goal, and all of you hope to be the first one to make this, uh, this important discovery. So I'm really, uh, I, yeah, I was amazed by, by Elena April's uh, uh, passion and her, her perseverance in, in this whole uh, project. And it's probably the same for other kind of people. I, I also interviewed uh, Rick Gateskell, uh, who was a very nice person to talk yeah. to. Uh, and unfortunately, because of the COVID pandemic, I could not visit the new laboratory that's now being constructed in the United States. It's not, uh, it's, I think it has become operational around this time so it's finished in, in any way but uh yeah all the all the experiments are in the book and uh i think uh maybe you 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 might say maybe despite this competition or maybe thanks to this competition the xenon experiments might well play an important role in solving the riddle absolutely yeah and and i think about uh yet another kind of uh saying that you just mentioned you know you want to be the first to get there um but often, um, you know, we speak about the first mover advantage in, in business and constructing things, but sometimes the last mover, you know, in the case of Galileo, uh, everybody knows Galileo's name. Nobody knows Hans Lippershey's name, <laughs> unfortunately for the Dutch, uh, but they're, you know, that, that, that's, that's okay. In other words, it's not the person who, you know, maybe initially had the idea, it's the person who makes the definitive ultimate measurement or utilization of that tool. And I wonder, mm -hmm. you know, if we can, you know, maybe close with the opening uh, character in this book, who couldn't be more f different than the fiery Elena April or the or the uh, wonderfully uh, you know kind of whimsical Richard Gateskill, and that's um, and that's uh, uh, Jim Peebles, who you begin the book with. And once about eight or nine years ago, Jim gave a colloquium here 
at UC San Diego, and I spent the day with him, and it was so much fun. And in the uh, colloquium, you know, he started talking about things, you know, that that uh, in his gentle Canadian way that he has uh, about, uh, you know, where, where do we go from here to, to detect things like this or to, to constrain them? And I said, you know, there's so many competing theories, and, and it's all just, you know, so bewildering. And he actually told me to shut up. Can you believe that? He said, he said, shut up and measure. He didn't say shut uh-huh. up. Uh, the, to me, yeah. uh, insulting me, but I'll always treasure the time that Nobel laureate uh, Jim Peebles told yours truly, Brian Keating, to shut up. Um, talk about you know that philosophy that really we should be kind of um, agnostic, uh, to use a loaded word, but uh, we should be agnostic as to what the dark matter might be, and it, and it could surprise us. Uh, he he, in his early papers, which you uh, really delightfully um, uh, unravel for me as a professional scientist. You know, we never, I don't have the time to read the papers that came out today, let alone the paper uh-huh. that was written the year I was born, yeah. uh, that, you know, start to make the case for, for cold, dark matter. But um, what what is your philosophy? Should we, I mean, in an era of constrained budgets, uh, you know, where you just talked about three different experiments, Lux, Panda, Xena, they're all, go- I mean, can we just say, you know, that, that, you know, we should all get along, we should all make a measurement, or is it really just worth the competition is good in and of itself in the case of Dama? How did you, how do you emerge from this, this wonderful story, which, which doesn't have the nice, neat, golden, you know, picture of Alfred Nobel at the end of it. Um, but talk about, you know, in the theory of, in the spirit of Jim Peoples, what would you think we should do going forward? More experiments, more theory, more computation? What's the best approach? Yeah, it's- it's a very, very difficult question. If it was an easy question, everybody would know the answer, and we would be doing that already. Uh, and again, I am not in a position to to judge the scientist or the or the uh, 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 or the um, the people who, who provide the money. So it's all uh, connected in that way. But at at some point in in uh, what you just said, you you talked about uh, we need to be agnostic and not having this particular view of what dark matter should be, and that's very very hard because we are all people, we are all uh, uh, loaded with uh, history and 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 our current view of, of physics and uh, and of the science we are working in. So I think it's very important to be uh, to be open and to have an open mind to new. Uh, uh, new angles and new new discoveries, and the the people who are best in being open are the young people, because uh, as soon as you are 25 or 26 or 27, you you start to lose your creativity and you get uh, too much um, influenced by uh, by the world around you, and so I think the creative ideas by young people are very important here, and maybe the best thing we could do is. Uh, is is even at an earlier stage maybe already at high school or at elementary school and to train our children to be creative in their thoughts and to be uh, uh, to be real scientific thinkers and to think out of the box and to know how it works how to check a scientific theory or a particular idea and to to learn which is important in these days of fake news and 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 uh, all kind of things that we now have to learn um what you can trust and uh, what what kind of measurements are necessary to 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 really be convinced by something and if we train the younger generation of being better scientists and to be much more creative than than the older generation who are all spending their careers in a particular direction and and maybe not so eager to 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 change gears anymore yeah maybe that will help us uh, forward and it's it's both in theory and in experiments, uh, there are a lot of young creative minds and new technologies that come around, and that may give us the possibility of dreaming up new experiments to solve this particular problem. I'm I'm certain that there will be a solution to the dark matter problem. I hope to be alive when it uh, when it will arrive, and uh, it might be extremely interesting if it's something completely unexpected. Uh, actually, I would love that, uh, but even if it's just another strange particle which is not that uh, unexpected it, it might be a, a very interesting find and i'm sure we will eventually get there if we have the creative minds and if we feed the creative minds to uh, go on with this Absolutely. but it's difficult uh, to to <laughs> not be um, influenced by uh, by common knowledge so to say yeah 
Well, Govert, this has been a delight, a treat for me. Uh, you're a delightful writer. Uh, you always inspire me to look deeper into mysteries that I might take for granted. You're not afraid to be technical, but you write with a, a poet uh, and, and kind of the uh, delightful prose that uh, is rare in scientific, so-called pop popular science. Um, so I want to thank you. Uh, we've been talking today with Govert Schilling, uh, author of Ripples in Space Time, with an endorsement by uh, Lord Martin Reese on the front of it, a forward by him, and by uh, today's book, we discussed the elephant in the universe. What is it? Is it a tusk? Is it a rope? Is it a is it a tree? What is the elephant in the universe? Uh, you will find out more about this stalking elephant uh, pachyderm that is lurking in the universe when you read this wonderful book. Govert, where can people find you online? Uh, I'm uh, active on Twitter. It's just uh, my Twitter handle is just my first and last name uh, strung together. Go for Schilling. Uh, I have my own uh, website, but it's uh, basically in Dutch, obviously. But uh, all the stories that I write for English language magazines like uh, Sky Telescope that you mentioned or Sky at Night in the UK, you can find my uh, English language articles there, too. Uh, but uh, I look forward to meeting your uh, uh, podcast viewers on uh, uh, on Twitter or uh, whenever, and maybe in the future in person. Yeah, it'll be great. And thanks yeah. very much for having me, Brian. It was a pleasure uh, talking to you, and thanks for your kind words about my book. Thank you so much for coming on, Govert. Be well. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic.